கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and welcome to the second episode of Bhakti Bhava. And now we're going to dip into the bhakti tradition and begin with a very famous verse, Sanskrit verse describing the nature of pure bhakti. அநியாதிலாஷிதாஷுன் கர்மாஜானம் ஆனுகூயன ஆத்மாஷீலம் பக்திருக்கோவர் திசனம்ஸ் அநியாதிலாஷிதாஷுன் டிவோய்ட் ஆஃப் அதர் டிசையர்ஸ் கர்மா by unselfish service gyanam by self realization adi and the other yogas anavritam uncovered anukulena favorable atma anushilanam by cultivation of service in relationship with the self bhaktihi devotional service relationship uttama unexcelled now here's the translation one must be completely devoid of other desires one's real nature uncovered by practice of the four yogas and constantly cultivate service favorable to the self this is pure unexcelled bhakti Pure bhakti means uttama bhakti, unexcelled. The word ultimate is related to the Sanskrit uttama. So in uttama bhakti, we have pure bhakti without any other desires. Let's go through the translation line by line and explain things. One must be completely devoid of other desires. that means one should only desire bhakti because bhakti is like how can i explain like a wish fulfilling tree or like a cornucopia uh in the roman tradition the cornucopia was a horn that would deliver anything desired well the same with the desire tree or uh there's also a wish fulfilling cow in the vedic tradition that you ask this cow for anything and she'll deliver it so this is bhakti bhakti can give us anything we desire up to and including full liberation why then would we want to desire anything else <laughs> so we should desire only bhakti that's pure bhakti one's real nature uncovered by practice of the four yogas the four yogas are karma bhakti raja and jnana this is given in upadesha undiyar which we covered in another series now why do we need these four yogas because in the beginning it's not possible for us to only desire bhakti actually one has to be in a liberated state uh with no ego and no mind simply residing in the self to attain pure bhakti or to practice pure bhakti pure bhakti is therefore the liberated condition which comes as a result of practicing the four yogas the result of each yoga finds its roots and its fulfillment in bhakti and we'll explain how this is in the upcoming episodes 
and constantly cultivate service favorable to the self. Bhakti is not mere sentiment. It's not just sitting around and dreaming about some future state that we might attain. No, bhakti is here and now a service relationship because this body has certain activities attached to it called prarabdha karma. And even for a liberated soul, that prarabdha karma must happen. However, we can link that prarabdha karma with the purpose of favorable service to the self. And that nullifies it completely. <laughs> it has no possibility of making us suffer because everything that we do, think, and say is related to the source of all bliss. And that means there's no suffering connected with it. And finally, this is pure, unexcelled bhakti. So there's pure bhakti, and then there's mixed bhakti, which does not give the same results. It may give some partial result, but partial is still not complete, not full, not pure, and certainly not unexcelled. Unexcelled means there is nothing better. And when we experience this pure, unexcelled bhakti, we can't imagine anything that could be better than this because there's no downside to it at all. There's no suffering in it at all. It's simply pure bliss. And even when we're in the midst of it, sometimes we wonder, how is this possible? This is astonishing. This is fabulous. And that's because in the state of pure bhakti, we receive reciprocation from the self or God, depending whether we're in mixed bhakti or pure bhakti. If we're in pure ananya bhakti, we see everything as the self. In mixed bhakti, we still have some attachment to duality. And so we have to see that everything is the result of God. Everything is God's doing, not our doing. So now, what are the symptoms of Ananya Bhakti? Let's analyze this in detail according to the Vedic scriptures. The first one is Swarupa Lakshana, which means intrinsic characteristics. Intrinsic means that they are part and parcel of Bhakti. You cannot separate them. Bhakti wouldn't be what it is without them. Just like the intrinsic characteristic of the sky is its blueness, its spaciousness, and its unperturbability. The sky is there always. Maybe clouds come and go, even storms and wind, dust and smoke, the sun, moon, and stars come and go, and yet the sky always remains the same. Bhakti is like that, pure bhakti. Uh, so the intrinsic characteristic of bhakti is its eternality, its purity, and its resilience or anti-fragility, that everything that comes and goes cannot affect it at all. So constantly cultivate service favorable to the self. This is pure, unexcelled bhakti. That's the third and fourth lines of our translation. This is the intrinsic characteristic of bhakti, that one who is engaged in bhakti constantly cultivates this service. And why, why do we cultivate this service? Because we have to be active anyway, because of our prarabdha karma. But why should we be active in a way that creates further karma and further bondage and suffering. Better that we engage the prarabdha karma in the service of the self, constantly cultivating favorable actions 
toward the self or in relation with the self. And this gives us a feeling of liberation, even in the present body. Another intrinsic characteristic is positive actions to be done. In the yoga system, this is called yama. This is preparatory to the actual engagement in yoga. Yama and niyama. And we'll see that the first part of the translation is about niyama. Actions not to be done. So what are the actions to be done? Well, we're going to get into that in great detail in this series. But first of all, we have to introduce the idea of the intrinsic qualities of bhakti. What's next? The extrinsic qualities, tatashta lakshana. The extrinsic means that they are qualities on the outside or associated with bhakti. But they are not what makes bhakti what it is. They can come and go. They can be temporary like the wind and the clouds in the sky. Sometimes the sun is out, sometimes it's down. Sometimes the moon is a crescent, sometimes it's full. Sometimes there are storms and rain, and sometimes the sky is clear. Nevertheless, the sky always remains the same. So the intrinsic qualities of bhakti are that it is about this continuous cultivation of favorable service to the self. We're talking about ananya bhakti here. And then the extrinsic qualities are one must be completely devoid of other desires and one's real nature uncovered by practice of the four yogas. So the other yogas, karma yoga, raja yoga, and jnana yoga, are not alien to bhakti yoga. In fact, they're all part of one thing, and that is uncovering our real nature. Our real nature is nothing but the self. So when we practice these yogas, we uncover the real self and we get rid of the false ego, the false identity, that is identity as the material body. And we realize our true identity as pure consciousness. And these are the negative actions not to be done. One must not have any desire other than bhakti because only bhakti is the source of bhakti. It has no relation with anything material. So let's look a little deeper into the intrinsic characteristics of bhakti. Anushilanam means constant cultivation, that one is engaged in bhakti 24-7. There is no time when one is not doing bhakti. And how is that possible? Well, we already talked in the previous series about offering one's consciousness to the self as a form of bhakti. And this is the highest form of bhakti, because actually pure consciousness is the only fitting offering to the self, because the self is only pure consciousness itself. And what is that constant cultivation of? Activity and sentiment, action and emotion. So the actions that we cultivate are the actions of bhakti sadhana. And we're going to go over those actions in great detail in this series, in the episodes coming up. And what is the emotion? It's called bhakti anubhava. Now, we know what bhakti means, and we know a little bit about bhava. And anu means following. So in other words, the emotions that arise spontaneously after performing bhakti, the actions of bhakti are causes of a certain emotion, transcendental ecstatic emotion, bhava. We went over that in the previous episode. So what happens when we perform bhakti sadhana 
is that these ecstatic emotions will arise spontaneously. Not that we have to try to create them. So after the action comes the sentiment. And those two together form what we call bhakti consciousness. Sattvika bhava or ecstatic symptoms will manifest. And we'll go through these in detail. Also, we have different kinds of spontaneous ecstasy. Permanent or sthai bhava. Sthai means standing. Huh? Standing still. We always have like an undercurrent of spontaneous ecstatic emotion in one particular mood. And that is our sthai bhava, our permanent ecstatic emotion. And then there are transitory emotions or anubhava, which arise at different times due to our activities in bhakti. Further intrinsic characteristics are anukulyena, service performed completely free of any attitude that is unfavorable or hostile to the self. Yeah. Any attitude that is favorable is bhakti. Any attitude that is unfavorable is not bhakti. Uh, this is called aparadha, or offense. Okay? So the attitude we must have toward the self must be completely favorable for our actions to be accepted as bhakti and to cause the results of bhakti. Any unfavorable attitude, even though it may seem externally pure, is not bhakti. So the corollaries to this are activity that is externally pleasing or favorable to the self, but done without devotion is not bhakti. When someone performs a puja in the temple, for example, but they're thinking about something else. Oh, when I'm done with this ceremony, then I can go have a cup of tea <laughs> or beer <laughs> or meet my girlfriend or whatever. That's not bhakti. That's just going through the motions externally, but internally, it's not bhakti at all. Another example is, one time, uh, some demons attacked Krishna and the, the demons were hitting on Krishna's limbs. Huh? Of course, nothing was happening. But he felt it as very pleasurable. Ah, yes, good massage. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is not considered bhakti. Even though it was pleasurable for Krishna, the incarnation of the self. It's not bhakti because their attitude was unfavorable. They were trying to kill him or harm him. Conversely, activity that is extrinsically hostile or unfavorable to the self, but is done with devotion, is bhakti. Huh? Sometimes we hear people talking uh, in a very loose way with the self. Oh, why have you put me in this situation where I have to do so much sadhana? I can't stop even for one minute. Huh? <laughs> or why have you taken me away from my family and friends and brought me here to this place where there is nothing to do but meditation and devotional service? <laughs> so externally, there may seem to be some bad sentiment, some hostile sentiment toward the self. But actually, within, there's an attitude of bhakti. Why? Because there's a favorable sentiment within. Another example was the one I gave before, that one is doing service in the temple, but has no real devotion internally. So we have to be careful to distinguish between the external actions and the internal attitude. And that is what determines whether something is bhakti or not. Now, in the next episode, we'll go over the external or extrinsic characteristics of bhakti. 
ओम तत्सत ओम हरि ही ओम करुणार्णवाय करदिनु अरुणाचल शिव गीता